lovely Floss Tube friends and welcome back for part four of the full coverage mini series for beginners. We're getting so close to being where we need to be people, so close. I'm going to say to you needles and you're going to say, what do we need to know about needles, right? <laughs> You'll be surprised what you need to know about needles. There are so many different needles out there. So just as an example, there are cross stitch needles, there are embroidery needles, there are sharp needles, there are beading needles, there are quilting needles, there are darning needles, there are Chanel needles, there are tapestry needles, there are plastic needles. The list goes on. All you need to know is that a tapestry needle is a cross stitch needle. Job done. That's all you needed to know. So if you are looking for your needles, you will need to just look for tapestry needles or cross stitch needles. Please don't make the mistake and think that an embroidery needle is the same as a tapestry or cross stitch needle, because it's not. An embroidery needle is a sharp needle. It's sharp and it's pointy. A tapestry needle, cross stitch needle is blunt. We don't want to be making any additional actual holes in our fabric. We want a blunt needle so that the blunt needle automatically finds the existing holes that are in the fabric that we are stitching on. We do not want to be piercing our fabric or making new holes, that is not what we wanna do. So please make sure that when you're purchasing your needles, it is a tapestry needle or a cross stitch needle. So when you start talking about the needle thing, you're like, okay, okay, so we just need an embroidery needle or we need a, a you know, we don't want an embroidery needle, we just need a tapestry needle. So now that you've made your decision of what fabric you're gonna stitch on, that decision is set in stone now, you've calculated your fabric, we now need to look at our needles because the needles, it isn't one needle fits all. Now I'm going to loosely tell you what the recommended guidelines are and I say loosely because just because the guidelines say that you have to have this needle for this size, it's not strictly true. If you want to take it to the letter then yes, take it to the letter. If however that you find that certain needles you struggle to thread the eye of the needle because the needle is so small, you can move a size or two here and there. My only guideline that I follow personally is that if the needle that I'm putting through the hole makes my hole too much bigger than it already is, then I will be mindful. You don't want to be sort of creating a massive great hole just because you want a needle that's got a bigger eye on it. So just for the record, we discussed different counts and we talked about the aders. So you've got the 14 count ader, 16 count ader, 18 count ader and 20 count ader. So if you was going to stitch on a 14 count ader, you will want a tw size 24 needle. A 16 count ader will have a 26 size needle and an 18 count ader will have a size 28 needle. When we start shifting into higher counts so anything from so basically the more the even weave side so when you're looking at the 22 count even weave 25 count even weave and there is even a 27 count even weave which we're not going to go into you would use the guideline says a 22 needle size 22 if you was going with a 28 count fabric you would use a size 24 needle 32 count fabric is a 26 needle. I'm not going to go any higher than that because you will not be stitching our full coverage on anything higher than a 28 count. And if you do, then you're crazy. <laughs> so there we go. Obviously, this is just guidelines that they give us for the sizing. So with recommended guidelines, it is just that. It's a recommendation of guidelines. But like I say, that's not to say that you have to follow it. Once again, with needles, the needles are very similar to the fabric in the respect of the sizing. So, so as with the fabric, your needle sizing is personal preference to a certain extent based on the fabric that you're stitching it on. 
The sizes of the needles are sort of very similar to the fabric. So the higher the number on fabric, the smaller the squares are. It sort of works the same with the needles. So the higher the size of the needle, so if it's a, 20, a size 28 needle, that will have a much smaller eye and be a much smaller needle than say a 24. So as an example, let me just show you. So this is a size 24 needle. Let's see if I can do this without a glare. And this is a size 28 needle. Now please be advised also that this needle over to the left, your left, is a petite needle. They do short needles and they do longer needles. So just to prove the point, if I put a size 26 regular with a size 24 regular, you can easily see that the size 24 is bigger than the size 26. And when I'm saying bigger, I mean the eye of the needle. It's thick, you know, one is thicker and one is thinner. But like I'm saying, it's not a deal breaker. So for instance, if your fabric tells you that you should be using, I don't know, um, a size 22 needle, but you don't like a size 22 needle, you actually like a size 24 needle, then it's perfectly acceptable. Like I say, it's very much personal preference. It's just a guideline. The only time I would say that just be a, be a little careful of, of making changes is just make sure that it's not a drastic change in size. You know, one size won't make a massive difference. A few sizes, that will make a difference. So like I said, it's recommendation only. If you choose to go with a needle that is one size bigger or smaller than the recommended size, that's perfectly fine. Be your own best judge. If you stitch better with a certain needle, go with that needle. Unless, of course, we're talking massively different sized needles, it really isn't a deal breaker. Um, the only other thing that I would say is for those of you that are using your needles, please be careful if you've got pets. Um, most stitchers nowadays use something called a needle minder, which is basically a magnet that sits behind the back of the fabric with a pretty little thing on the front of the fabric and we stick our needles to that. One, it makes it so that you don't have to be searching for a needle, you just go to your needle minder and you know that your needle is there waiting for you. That's the plan. That is the plan. Um, also, if say for instance you was to put the needle into the fabric and then you left the project for a, a certain amount of time, you always run the risk that it's either, you know, it's gonna leave a mark on the fabric, which on a full coverage isn't really a deal breaker, um, but it's just not particularly good practice. So there we go. That is your needles. See, that was short and sweet, just how we like it. So what else could we possibly need to talk about, I hear you say? Surely we're ready to start stitching now. <laughs> we were nearly there. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, we're nearly there. So we've covered fabrics, we've covered our charts, we've covered our threads, we've covered needles. We are on the last legs, people. And the last leg is, what are you gonna use to do your stitching. So when I'm saying, what are you gonna use? There are some very, very clever people in the world. And when I say clever people, they're like super clever. These super clever people do something called stitch in hand. And if you ever get to see someone doing it, they just make it look so easy. But then I'll assure you, I say this, I assure you, I tried it and it's far from easy. So I applaud the people that stitch in hand because it's a whole nother world. But basically stitching in hand means that they, they gather the material up, they hold it in their hand and they just stitch. They don't need any other equipment, they just need needle, thread, fabric, off they go. They must be super clever. I've never been able to do it. I don't cope well with having it everywhere. I have tried stitching in hand on smaller pieces and I tend to find that 
my stitching isn't regular it's sort of irregular because my tension goes all over the place and yeah it's just not for me and to be honest if you're working on a bigger project you can try stitching in hand I'm assuming that it's one of those things that once you learn how to do it it's actually an easy way it definitely makes for easier carrying your projects around because you can just fold them up but for most people when they're working on bigger projects and they're working on heaven and earth designs and full coverage they will have something that they use to hold their fabric now there's lots of different choices we're back to the choices i know i know you're like cheesy just i don't care but you really will i can you really will i promise you really will so what do i use to hold my fabrics well mine for a new beginner will be a little overkill so this isn't a full coverage but this is something that's on a frame at the moment so this is my frames so you've got your bars which is what you meant have your material is folded around and then I've got my stretcher bars at the side which stretch the fabric and I just loosen it off at the end of each session so that it's not keeping my fabric too tall. It's just good practice. These are Millennium Frames um, by Needle Needs. I'll put the link below. They are exceptionally good frames. However, I will put this out there that the waiting time to have these shipped out to you can be really quite a long time. So there are a lot of people that are not prepared to wait that long for those frames. And I can completely understand why you would think that. For me, obviously, because I've already got them, I've literally just slowly over the course of time, once every month or once every couple of months, I'll just order a new set of bars and they take as long as they take to get here because I've got other bars. That way I've managed to accumulate the full set so that I've got a full set of all the bars and a couple of double ups for the sizes that, that suit my needs. Like I said, um, they are an amazing piece of kit. They're not cheap, um, but they are fabulous if you're gonna really get into this. But the shipping time and the turnaround time for actually having these made, is it's, it's long. I know people that have waited nine months a year before they've received them out in the states so there is an alternative so i will put the link down here and the link is for the um it's omanique and they are quantum frames so they are basically built around the same sort of principle as the millennium frames but the stretcher bars at the sides have got plastic sections in them but the shipping time is fractional in comparison so your shipping time will be super quick um, and from a cost perspective they're actually a cheaper version i know a lot of people that use them the service is great definitely one to look at if you're looking for something that's a bit more superior now we've started at the top end of the range here we're, we're right up here at the you know the most expensive so working our way down from there, there are normal what I call scroll bars that you can buy, which I don't know, you can get them from most of your LNSs and online needle stores where they've got, you know, you either baste it on where you sort of attach your fabric to a like, bit of fabric that's attached to a bar and you just roll it once it's basted on. But once it's on that, it doesn't come back off. There's another version which basically is... Um, similar as in it's got the, the scroll rods you attach your fabric with some clips and then you roll that and then it's got some sides on it but they're very flimsy um if i'm honest do i rate them not amazingly so your next option to that which i think is probably for most people the most cost effective is this and I know what you're thinking, like, what is on earth is that? Well, this, people, is Q-Snap. Mine looks a bit of a strange size because I've actually adapted mine 
to suit a certain project. So the way these work, they're basically just plastic piping is what it is. And it comes with these, which are your clips, which is what holds your fabric onto the, onto the Q-snap. So you pull all of those off and you're left with this. Now these are all interchangeable. So normally when you buy these Q-snaps, it will be like an 11 by 11 or a 17 by 17 or a nine by nine. Um, what I've done for this, because obviously my project is slimmer, but longer, I've used the 11 bars across the top and the bottom and interchanged it with a set of 17s on the side and then just used the appropriate clips. That's the beauty of the Q-snaps. Just as there are Q-snaps, here in the UK there are another similar product to this called r and &R. I'm gonna put this out there purely because it's my own personal experience I tend to find that the Q-Snap are more superior than the r and I've got both, I've tried both. The Q-Snaps, I don't know whether it's to do with the clips, but they hold the fabric much tighter with a Q-Snap. The r and I tend to find sort of loosens off, even when I've put something in between my fabric and the clip to try and give it a bit more, something more to grab onto. So how do we use these, you ask? Well, it's pretty straightforward. We'll use this as an example, my trusty grey spaces. Now some people will put, a, they will get some felt or another bit of fabric and when they've sort of, when they put it on, they put it over the top before they put the next clip on, purely because it gives it a little bit more grip. The other reason that you would want to put an extra bit of fabric over this is if, say for instance, your stitching is going to go higher, you're going to need to move your stitching around and there's a chance that you're going to need to put a clip over some existing stitching. You don't want to put it directly onto your stitching. So what you don't want to do is have your stitching like that and stick this straight over the top you would want another bit of fabric. So if say for instance, you was moving your project up because you needed to get to this bit down here, but by doing that, your stitching is now gonna go over where the clip needs to go, like so. At that point, some, they, most people will get either some felt or another bit of fabric that will lay over the top of their stitching and then they will put the clip on like so, okay? That's how it works. We don't need to do that. So to put your fabric on, you will literally square your fabric up over the top of it, stick the clips on. Always do your opposite end, so you do your top and your bottom first. Make it so that it's a little bit taut, not overly taut, like so. Do your sides. See? It's a doddle, people. And then, there we are. So then to tighten this up, to make it so that your fabric is nice and tight for you to stitch on, because one thing I do like is a good bit of tension. I like this to be nice and taut for my stitching. So to do that, you literally, these bars, you just, turn them towards the back. And by turning the clips towards the back, we'll tighten the fabric up. And then if I tap on this, it's like a drum. And that's perfect for stitching on. Now, you will notice that at the back here, there's all this fabric, which is getting in the way. They also supply with Q-snaps, they also supply something either known as a Q-snap cover or a grime guard. So all you do is stick it round. This is really good to have anyway because it protects the edges of your fabric, especially if you're working, if you ever move on to something that's a bit more tricky than a full coverage and you go with something that's 
you know, um, something that you're likely to sort of need to have the fabric on show, it keeps it from getting dirty. And then all you do at the back here, where the fabric is still all sticking out, you fold it into the grime guard. The other beauty of having a grime guard cover like this, or grime guard, the covering section, is that if you've got extra fabric, it holds the fabric out the way of the back of the, out the back of it. So that, that way when you're stitching, you're not gonna accidentally stab some excess fabric that's floating around at the back here. So there you go. And as you can see, super nice and tight, perfect surface for your stitching of your full coverage. They're not massively expensive and they do the job perfectly. Now there is another option, well I say another option, there are people in the world that will do a full coverage using a hoop. I personally don't use hoops, never have used hoops, um, and I'm not sure that I ever would use a hoop on a full coverage, purely because when you're pushing, when you're pushing your hoop through one bit of wood into the next bit to get the surround and to get that tension, I would just be a little concerned that it's going to distort in the circle. I think you would need to be quite proficient with one of those hoops in general before you sort of did it on a full coverage. You know, if, you, if you're used to using a hoop, then I'm sure using a hoop on a full coverage is perfectly fine. I personally wouldn't go that route. I like the idea of having lots of, lots of stitching space. And obviously with hoops, you don't necessarily get that because they're that much smaller. I prefer something like this. The beauty of the reason why I use my scroll frames is because at no point do I want to be putting clips or anything over my stitching. I don't mind my stitching folding in on itself. I mean, even to be honest with Q-snaps like this. Ideally, I would only have something that goes as far as this. I wouldn't want to be putting my stitching underneath the clip. That is just my personal take on it, but there are alone lots of people that do massive hades, heaven and earth design charts, full coverage, and they do them all on a Q-snap and they just move the Q-snap around the project. And it's never a problem. Again, it's a personal preference thing. You have to decide what is the right tool for you. If you're a total, total beginner, would I advise you to go and buy these all singing, all dancing scroll frames? No, not in a million years. Give it a try first. You know, if you, if you, if you want to do it, grab yourself a Q-snap. It's not overly expensive. Stitch on it for a month or so. If you fall in love, then yes, of course, go and buy yourself some, some frames to, to work off of. But as a beginner, Q-snap is perfectly acceptable. You get just, a, just the same amount of tension in, this, in the fabric for your stitching as you do on one of the scroll frames, such as mine. Um, at that point, once you're here and you've got to this point, you can sit and stitch on your lap. I personally use a stand. Um, when I'm sat on my sofa. So if I sit on my sofa, I will use the stand that is the same brand as my frames. That's just a personal preference. And I only do that when I'm in the living room. If I'm going in the bedroom, then obviously I can't use the stand because the stand slides up to me and my project sits on top. At that point, the Q-snap comes out if I'm going in the bedroom, then I will just sit and stitch and balance it on me or on, on a cushion or on the arm of the chair. That's the beauty of the Q-snap. It's sort of a go wherever you go type project. Um, that said, there is absolutely, if, if you can't handle the whole having to hold the, the Q-snap and stitch on it at the same time, you've always got the option of getting a frame, a frame, 
You've always got the option of getting a stand of some description and, and just using the stand with your Q-snap. The two most, well, obvious choices are a Lowry stand. So I will put a picture here of what a Lowry stand looks like. Um, they are basically a little metal clamp and you clamp the side of it onto your stitching, which they will then sit in front of you. So there's, it comes in from the side so that if you're sat on the sofa, it will slide into you like that and you can just sit and stitch and you just turn it over to end your threads or we'll get into that bit later. There's lots of laters, isn't there? Um, you can have it so that you have a Lowry stand attachment, like a clamp that sits on there that will hold it for you. So you, you just stitch, you don't have to hold this. The beauty of having some sort of stand is that if you want to do two handed stitching, then you can because you're not relying on this hand holding as well as taking the needle to the back. This just dives into so many areas when I'm actually sitting there doing this video. You don't realize it because it's all become sort of second nature, but in actual fact, there's so much to know. So, like I said, so Q-snaps, you can use a Lowry stand, you can use a normal frame stand like I've got. And again, I will put a picture here or a, you know, when we start stitching, I will actually show you my stand. But it's basically a stand with arms that comes up. This would sit on the top and I can just flip my work over. But at no point do I have to actually hold my stitching. I don't have to hold it in my hand or hold it on my arm or hold it against anything. It just sits on a stand. For the Q-snaps, they do actually do one called a lap stand or it's, it's basically a stand with the project. I will put some links in the video here for you to go and check it out. It's not what I use, but I know that people do use them. And I think there are some videos of actually how to make your own. So you just go and get some, some UPV, is it PVC piping and you can make your own. So again, it could be as cheap as chips if you want it to be. It's what I'm saying. This, this, this hobby can be as expensive or as cheap as you want it to be. Yes, it will cost you something to get started and the initial outlay will be more than get sort of your normal ticking along. But once you've got some of the equipment to make your life easier, it is an absolute pleasure. So like I say, there are lots of different versions of what you can use. The Q-snaps are very versatile, as in that they come with a stand or that you can build your own stand or that you can use them with a Lowry stand or you can use them with my type of frame or my type of stand, which is just arms that my normal project would sit on. The Q-snap would sit on it perfectly as well. Um, again, if you went with the quantum frames, which is the, the ones that are very similar to the Millennium frames, so this bit here is slightly different, but the concept of this and how this works is all the same. For the quantum frames, they do stands, big floor stands. But again, you need to think, you know, if you're gonna go start buying the frames, there's buying frames is one thing. But when you start looking at the stands, please be mindful that a lot of the stands, other than say things like the Lowry stands, a lot of the stands are actually quite big. So, you need a place in your house where you're going to be fine with having a stand sort of stood up standing somewhere. You know, if you're one of these real clean freaks, minimalistic people, doesn't like anything anywhere that it shouldn't be, you need to be thinking of that. You need to be thinking, okay, is that going to be an eyesore? Or have I got a designated stitch in place? Have I got a designated space for my stand to be? It's all very well and good getting these stands, but sometimes when you get these stands and they turn up, it's like, wow, that was bigger than I thought it was gonna be. And then obviously it's stuck in your living room or in your stitching room or in your, wherever it is that you're doing your stitching. So again, it's the same as anything. You need to think about the situation you're in, the affordability. You know, if you're brand new at this, you don't wanna be spending lots of money on all these things, in which case, 
Q-snaps and one of those PVC holders is perfectly acceptable to get you going. If you then fall in love with it and you just, you know, you're doing it six months later, then yes, you can invest in things. But I really don't agree with just going out and buying all the kit, doing it for, I don't know, three months, six months and go, actually, it's not for me. How many of you have done that on something else? <laughs> I know I have. <laughs> so this is it. My advice to you is only get what you really need to get. If, if it does the right job and it's cheap and it's cost effective, then try that route. If you then find that you love it or you're a seasoned stitcher, you know, and you're just sort of here along for the ride of these videos of sort of how I do hades and how I do full coverage. If you've been stitching long enough and you know that, you know, the bug isn't going away, you love it, then yes, invest. But again, you just need to be mindful that when you're investing in some of this bigger equipment, you need to be able to house it or it needs to have a home, it needs to have a place. So like I said, you need to be mindful of how much money you're spending, what equipment you're using, go with what's right for you, do your research first. Like I say, don't go massively expensive if you've only just started. The Q-snap route along with some sort of stand, whether it be a Lowry stand or whether it be a plastic piping stand, is perfectly acceptable to get into the swing of things and make sure you, that you like it first. So that's it people, we're there, we're at that point. That point where I've told you everything that I needed to tell you or everything that I could think to tell you before we actually sit and do some stitching. So on that note, I will leave you to go and get your final bits and pieces together and make all those final decisions and next time we see each other, we will be stitching. How exciting is that? Super exciting. <gasps> Are you scared yet? Don't be scared. I promise it will not be as bad as you think it might be. Um, for those of you that have got any questions, I will do a bit of a Q&A in the videos as we go along um, and possibly do an actual Q&A video based on all the questions that come in regarding this mini series. I'm just mindful that if you leave a comment below asking me a question and I respond to that, the likelihoods are that question will come up again. So rather than making people trawl through the comments, it might just be easier for us to sort of tackle the comments as we go, or there will be a whole video that is based around questions that come in to this point. Not quite sure how I'm gonna do it yet, but we're gonna have something so that it's out there. I'm sorry, my dog's just having a little cough over there, sitting outside in the garden. So, it's super exciting. Please don't be scared. The next time we see each other, we're gonna actually do some stitching. I can't wait, I'm super excited. So until next time, people, bye bye for now. <laughs>